All right, so I think it's time for us to get started. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, this is a continuation of our fall COVID-19 lecture and learn series. I'm very excited for today's meeting. This is something I wanted to do from the very beginning. So I'm excited that we're doing it today. Um, so today we have with us uh, Rachel Astor. She is a local registered dietitian from Buffalo. Um, a little bit about her before we get started. Uh, she actually received her BSMS in dietetics uh, in May 2020 from Deaville College. Before that, she received her BS in informatics uh, in 2008 from the Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, a little bit about her, she believes that everyone deserves access to the information to lead a healthy and enjoyable life. Uh, during several years of community-based work, she learned uh, the great deal of chronic disease in Western New York, uh, particularly among our most vulnerable citizens, those who can't afford better food and have a lack of access to it. Uh, while there are concerted efforts towards providing better access to healthier food choices, many individuals do not necessarily have the nutritional knowledge of food preparation skills to make these better choices. So her goals are to help the community become healthier through better diet choices. Um, so I'd like to remind everybody, if you have any questions uh, for Rachel or for myself, please submit them through the chat, either directly to, to me or to everyone. It really doesn't matter, whatever your comfortability level is for today. Um, I have some prepared questions, but again, I'm always willing to add some more to the docket. So without further ado, I will pass it on to Rachel. You should be able to share your screen. Um, if you know anybody who was unable to attend this meeting, this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded um, hopefully by the end of the day on YouTube, but if not, definitely by the end of this week. So I'll let Rachel take it away. Thank you. I think you're muted. <laughs> yes, okay. I was stopping away like, oh, it's like you're muted. I'm like, okay. Uh, hi everyone, good morning. Um, I'm really glad to be here with you today to talk about nutrition. It's like something I'm totally into, obviously. So um, uh, thank you all for joining. And um, I guess we'll get started now. I've had a lot of difficulty in the last few times I've had presentations and like my screen like just disappearing when I try to share. So we'll see what happens. Um, I do have like a fail safe over here, like another computer where I can read my notes off of if um, I can't get, if I'll figure it out. If I'm just saying there may be an issue and then I'll, I'll rectify it. One second, we're gonna try this though. It might work, let's see. Um, so you guys got it? Can you see it? Looks good? Great. Okay, that's great. Okay, so we're working it out. Um, Cause, um, so good morning. Um, so today we're gonna talk about eating optimally during the pandemic. Um, as uh, now, I actually this presentation is a little old, honestly. Um, I wrote it at the beginning of the pandemic, not thinking we would still be needing this. Come um, six now, we about now six months later. I was under the impression that we would not still be needing um, this information. I when this first started, I totally thought we'd be in our house for two weeks. And then we all be going back to work and everything would be fine. And I was, I, I was very wrong. <laughs> um, and uh, I think we all were very sidelined by what occurred here. So uh, obviously with this huge change in um, our lifestyles, um, uh, some there, there's probably some alteration to our diet. So um, this is sort of, a, a, this is gonna be a conversation about um, what we can do to eat best during this time since it's not, it's gonna probably still be a, a little while longer while we're stuck here. So um, what now? Um, we have more time in a sense. Um, now, uh, now this pandemic's been going on for quite a while. We've, a lot of us have sort of acclimated to what we call this new normal, but um, we are given more time in our households in most cases. Most people are now back at home uh, or, or at least um, in home more often than they were because there's lots of less social activity occurring. And there's, um, you know, parents are, you know, have to stay home with their children. So there's a lot more time within our households, which can lead to way more distraction. Often with extra distraction comes because like, we get distracted from what we're eating. And so when we get distracted from what we're eating, um, we can make a lot of extra food choices that we were not aware we are making. Um, we can uh, make, we, given that this pandemic has been very stressful and has caused some families to lose employment, some families to lose family members, it's been you know, a very tough situation for a lot of people, it can cause more stress. And we often lean on food for when we are stressed out. Um, so there's definitely been more eating, more distractions, and then um, so, and also like I said, more stress eating. So a lot of people have bumped into this wonderful situation of the quarantine 15, which we usually associate with college starting, but um, a lot of people have gained weight during this time due to some extra eating. 
Um, so uh, if you did find yourself in that situation, don't don't blame yourself. There, you are not alone. Uh, a lot of, like I said, uh, this is not. This is um. While everyone is facing different challenges during this time period, everyone is facing challenges. It's like there's no there's no one that wasn't affected by this. Everyone's been affected in some way by this pandemic. So everyone's challenges are being faced. Like there are different challenges for every person, but everyone is facing different challenges. And when we are faced with challenges, we often, you know, we we eating becomes a smaller like thing that we don't necessarily notice we're doing more of or less of or really just we, we stop paying attention to it all together we just sort of get it done we're like okay we gotta get all stuff done let me just make sure i'm eating let me just eat this quickly let me eat out of convenience let me eat for whatever reason so it's very possible that you may have gained weight some people may have lost weight some people did take the time out to be like well since i had this opportunity to starve myself let me do it like you know like <laughs> like there's a lot of people, people have addressed this um quarantine uh this period of quarantine and um you know coronavirus in a very different way everyone has done different things but um if you find yourself uh eating maybe not the best nutritionally it's a good time to um maybe try to rectify that uh so I'll, now this is another issue um of maybe stress for some people and maybe a good point for others uh Schools did, uh, while you know our places of learning, they also did provide parents, in most cases, a degree of respite from their children during the middle of the day. And um, you know, it, it was just common that they provided that time of day to be free, so you could go to work or be at home or whatever you were working at home if you were working at home prior. Um, but now a lot of parents are working from home, and their kids are trying to do school at home, and it's just really stressful because these things are not what we are usually doing. Um, so often in that situation, we also are provide like in, in some situations, the school was also in, you know, in the situation with many lower economic individuals, the school was providing food for these children. The parents did not necessarily have the means to provide food for these children three times a day. And they were looking toward the schools to provide this food. So um, some families are, in, you know, finding themselves a degree of food insecurity and schools are doing what they can to rectify that. But there is, are a lot of households that are you know facing some degree of food insecurity right now and um i do have some places that you can go now if, if you find yourself in that situation i can share some information at the end of places that i know are giving out food i help run a food pantry myself that is giving out food in the moment of you know that in terms of COVID response so um if anyone does need information on that front i can definitely share some information for that at the end of the um, session as well there will be about 20 minutes of time to ask questions any questions you may want so Please don't worry about that. And I was also referring to that's like one class now. I um <laughs> found that when the quarantine started, a lot of people were saying, Oh, I guess I'll have my glass of wine. Now I'm not much of a drinker, but I am a sugar eater. So um while some people may lean toward wine at the end of the evening to calm down, I will probably eat some chocolate or cake or whatever I have in my house. So I just stopped buying those things because I know me. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, let me stop purchasing these things so they will not be available to me. Um so but like often that's what a lot of us are doing to sort of mitigate this different lifestyle that we're currently living in. Um, okay, so I want to speak today on some um, mindfulness around eating. Uh, mindfulness is a term we often think about in terms of like therapy and uh, like meditation, but it can also very much be applied to us nutritionally. Uh, you, when I say think about, when I when refer to mindfulness in terms of eating, it's really just simply thinking about what you're eating and being aware of what you're eating. Um, like I said, during this time, we are finding our lifestyles are very different right now than they've ever been really for most of us. Like uh, the majority of no, none of us around during that, uh, I think was the 1918, last time we had probably something like this occur. Uh, so um, uh, I would say uh, that this is probably a new experience for most of us. Um, so we are often trying to find a new way to exist within the current situation. And that can like, since that leads to stress and distractions and, you know, just trying to figure out like problem solving on a different level, you may not, you, you may not be eat, thinking about what you're eating as readily. You might be ordering out more or ordering out less or, um, you know, just find yourself in a situation where you don't have enough food or you couldn't get out to get enough food or you didn't or you find yourself in a situation where um you have to provide more food for your kids on like and you're just not a cooker yourself so you're just like trying to figure it out you don't really know exactly where to go on this front so you're just like i'm here have all the snacks you want <laughs> like so that's not the best thing so it's when i say when i speak to board mindfulness for eating i um 
say it's really based on awareness, which is really the same situation as mindfulness. We say be aware of how you're feeling. This is being more aware of how you're eating, but also how you're feeling as well, because often we eat because we are we, we eat for reasons that aren't hunger. Now I'm not saying that solely we should eat for hunger, because as human beings, we it's not our nature to only eat when we are hungry. We eat for social reasons, we need to celebrate, we eat. Um, Sometimes mistakenly, on um, bullet point two says we eat more hungry, we eat when we're thirsty, we are bored. Um, and those aren't good habits. We should not probably eat when we're thirsty or bored. That's why I say when you should be mindful when you're eating. Like, are you really addressing? Like, are you like are you thirsty? Are you really addressing the need for something at the moment, or are you just like trying to change your emotional state? Um, like I said, if you're bored and you just find yourself walking into the kitchen, try not to do that. You know, like usually, like, if you're um, if you have a uh, I've noticed myself like when I do feel like if uh like we often like I said stress or eating. Um so if you find yourself stressed out, then le like trying to find something in the kitchen, you know, acknowledge that you are stressed out. Or if you're eating something and you're like, wait, pause, why am I eating this? And I just ate breakfast. You know, I ate breakfast 10 minutes ago, why am I eating the next thing? Or I just ate lunch, why am I eating this? You know, like so um like did I need a snack at the moment? Or am I eating just because I not I have something else to do, or am, am I eating simply because I am in my living room all day and my kitchen is right there. Like, you know, like I'm in my living room, my kitchen is literally right there, and it's like, okay, and these almonds are right there, and those crackers are right there, and it's like, it's so, um, it's, we often find ourselves eating this, like, at work, there's different distractions, there's probably not necessarily a snack right there. Like, there might be, but there potentially isn't, and so we're, if we're moved out of the same environment, we can change our eating just because we're not in the same environment we're used to being in. Um, it's a good time if, um, I'll, I'll get to like tips on how to maybe curb some of that later, but um, it, it, this is something that's commonly going to occur. It's just how humans are. It's not, a lot of people blame themselves in these situations and um, it's not really something you should blame yourself for because this is sort of how we as humans, we act, especially in terms of eating. Like we have very weird things we do and eating is a, it's a comfort thing as well as um, a, you know, a thing we need to do. So it's not something you can just like cut off. Like if you find yourself having bad habits around eating, it's not as simple. Well, also it's simple because quitting smoking is not simple, but you don't need to smoke at all. That's what I'm saying. You don't need, there's no nutritional, there's no like no health value to smoking. You do need to eat at some point. So <laughs> you can't not eat. So it's harder to uh, um, change totally, completely get rid of bad habits on that front as it's not something you can completely avoid, you know, as you can completely remove from your lifestyle. You need to eat still. So, um, but when you are eating, I do want you to, like, as part of mindfulness, you need to take the time to enjoy what you're eating, which is leaning away from the distraction aspect of it. You don't really want to be distracted when you're eating. Now, I know that is not fully realistic to say, oh, when, because I mean, often when we do speak about this, it's advised that, you know, turn off your TV and make sure you turn your computer down and, you know, make sure you're focusing completely on what you're eating. and that's not necessarily realistic for everybody that um, may have something to eat, you know, have to eat lunch during their, you know, at home work break or eat breakfast in the morning when they're still trying to get their kids, you know, into their Zoom classes. This may not be that, like, but I do want you to take the time to enjoy what you are eating when you are eating it as it will help you address that, you know, be aware of what you're eating and not necessarily start seeking out something right after. Um, it takes your body about 20 minutes or so to acknowledge that it's full. So if you eat mindlessly for 20 minutes, you probably have eaten more than you um, maybe need in, a, in one sitting. So it's good to um, take the time to actually enjoy what you're eating to the best of your ability when you can, because and like, eat, what you, eat what you want within reason. Um, you shouldn't eat mm, steak and eggs probably for breakfast every day. <laughs> like, but like if you do um, like eat a reasonable quantity of um, food, certain foods, um, any, uh, if you eat oatmeal for breakfast every day, you can choose to do that. That's pretty healthy. But like I said, if you like steak and eggs and you want that occasionally, that's an okay thing. You just want to make sure you're eating a reasonable amount of that. And you don't want to do that necessarily every day. It would be a very high caloric source. Um, and if you do eat something bad or you drink that wine, that glass of wine at night, um, don't feel terrible about it. Cause that will send you into uh, a spiral of, you know, probably bad eating in general. Um, people often blame themselves when they've fallen off, like if they're trying to eat healthier, like, or follow some type of health diet plan. I, I don't really like to use the word diet too readily because dietitians, when we use the word diet, we're really just referring to your pattern of eating. We really don't want to 
it, 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 it is commonly used in terms of a method of eating to lose weight. Um, and that's not really how we like to use that word. It's, um, I mean, it's commonly used that way. So I don't wanna say it's the wrong interpretation of the word. It's sort of used in both aspects. Uh, when we say diet though, we mean, what are your patterns of eating? It, you can have a very healthy diet or a very bad diet. It's still your diet. It doesn't matter what it is. There's really no, it doesn't, it's just what it is. And then um, you can choose to adopt habits and things around your diet that would make it better or worse. Um, so if you make, a, I guess, a bad choice in your diet, uh, we would, I, I would advise that you don't feel terrible about it. Just the next time you eat, the next meal you have, try to make a better choice. That's really all it is. Like, you know, just it's always trying to just do a little bit better for yourself than negative. Like you'll get better at it as you get, as you um, progress with it. Um, healthy eating is more of a, is a lifestyle pattern. It's not a thing that people always look at weight as firstly the main qualifier of healthy lifestyle, which is not accurate either. But um, we look at weight as the main qualifier that and losing weight. And then once we get to that goal of whatever our goal weight is, the priority is done and we're good. And that's not how our bodies work. Unfortunately, it's not how we're set up. So even if you do reach this weight goal that you have, um, you do have to adopt, adopt, adopt practices like a lifestyle change or you will not maintain that weight loss. So it's a matter of really just looking at it as whatever diet you accept, you need to be ready to accept that diet, um, that choice of weight, your choice of eating. For your lifestyle, because this is not a short time that you're gonna have to eat like this. This is gonna be a very long time that you have to eat like this. And it really should be something that you enjoy as well as something that's gonna be beneficial to you. So um I like if you like to if you have cake, that's okay. If you have like you know like if you had a lot of cake and a lot of wine and a lot of meat and cheese, that's okay. But just try like the next meal you have, just be cognizant that you had all that stuff a couple hours ago and maybe you should have a salad. You know, like maybe the next day you should have a small meal. Like maybe you shouldn't eat like that more than, you know, once a month. Maybe you shouldn't have cake at everybody's birthday. It's not, you know, celebrate your birthday big. Don't celebrate everyone's birthday big. <laughs> like, no, don't know. So eating better. Um, now there are some common things that we as dietitians suggest around eating. There's a lot of fad diets out there and all these types of things. Um, realistically, I can say like, uh, there's really, I don't want to say this is a perfect way to eat. Um, the, the general consensus on a healthier diet would consist of significantly more vegetables than the standard American diet has in it. Um, when I say standard American diet, I mean pretty much the way the average American is like, you know, I was given our data and stuff, eats. It's not very healthy. Uh, we eat a lot of unrefined carbohydrate. We eat very little fiber. Um, and these are things that other cultures don't do as readily. And so our diet here is not necessarily the best way to eat, but it's sort of what we're grown up on, what we're used to. Um, and there is a lot less cooking nowadays occurring than what would what we like to compare ourselves to in the, you know, I guess they say the older times. Um, so I'll say before 1950. Uh, but with the advent of, you know, we, we, we invented a lot of new methods of food preservation over the last really 60 years that caused a lot of changes in our food systems. And um, so that's a whole other situation that would need to be tackled um, to probably get the entire country to eat healthier. But small steps that we can make on a personal basis, I say first and foremost, are cooking. Um, now, since we find ourselves in our households more now than we did previously, cooking is a great habit to start establishing if you can. Um, cooking is the best way to know what's going into your food. Nowadays, we have a lot of processed food that is not necessarily the healthiest food for us. It's usually laden with fat and sodium, which you need some of, but not a lot. You don't want extra. Um, so if you cook your own food, you have complete control over pretty much what's going in it more or less. Um, and that what makes it, that's really what makes it healthier. It's that you know what you're putting in it. You're fully aware of the like, you're not fully aware of sodium levels unless you're actually going to look at how much salt and, you know, but you're, you're better, at, you have a way better idea. And usually when you buy folks food in the market, it has, it has preservatives in it too, like has like extra salt, extra things in it to preserve it, to make it last longer on those shelves. If you're cooking your own food and you season it yourself, you're probably using way less salt than would be prepared in it, unless you, know, you add a lot of salt yourself. If you do that yourself, well then that could be a potentiality. But um, there's usually less salt when you cook your food because you're preparing it and there's not um, the need for preservation in the same way. Um, if you are cooking more, 
I would ask people to reconsider how they're cooking. They're, um, we ask people to lean away from frying, basically. Uh, frying your food lends a lot of extra calories to it, which, and flavor, I'll give it that. I'm not gonna say that frying your food is not delicious. It is very much delicious, but um, uh, it lends a lot of extra calories to our food that we really shouldn't necessarily get um, on a regular basis. Like I said, we can like we should treat our less healthier ways of eating um, as treats. They are we should treat it as treats. Not something we should do every day. You can do it sometimes, but every day is not necessarily the wisest way to go out to that. Um, so you can consider um, other methods of cooking, like poaching, braising of meats. Um, I'm a huge fan of currying anything. Like you can curry just about any meat there is. People do curry chicken, but like, like fish. I've been fish. I can do curry just chickpeas. Um, I do a lot of vegetarian meals sometimes just to cut back on calories. I'm not a proponent necessarily in that veganism isn't necessarily a thing that you should do or vegetarianism is a thing that you have to do, but they are healthier lifestyles to lead um, just for the nature of vegetables having the low calorie density that they have and the high nutrient density that they have. Um, so it is a very good way to eat, but it's restrictive and many people just don't naturally gravitate toward it. So I that is very good to maybe try to incor incorporate some vegetarian meals into your diet, some vegan meals into your diet, but it is not required to become vegan or vegetarian for optimum for optimal health. Um, you can definitely have some degree of meat, some degree of things that aren't, you know, I guess following those type of eating patterns um, without and still be a very healthy individual. It's just you want to cut back on levels of meat and stuff. And everyone pretty much in America can increase the amount of vegetables they eat. We um, have an issue with fiber in this country that I don't <laughs> um, love, the average American gets about seven grams of fiber a day. And we need, as women need about 25 to 30 grams a day and men need about 35 to 40 grams a day. And so as you can see, seven is way lower than both those numbers, significantly lower. And so I try to advise that people get as many more vegetables into the diet as possible. I, we eat in this, country about meat, meat probably, you know, it's often suggested, you know, eat meat three times a day, you can have bacon at breakfast and chicken at lunch and steak at dinner and like, you know, or fish or, you know, just like eat meat all the time. And um, that's not required. That's way more meat than we should be eating, but that was marketed to us in the fifties to help farmers. Um, same with dairy. Dairy's not bad for you. There's also a lot of <laughs> misinformation about dairy, about dairy being bad for us. Dairy is not bad for us. It is just simply something that we are not able to process within our bodies without lactate. And that is something that sort of vein, like veins out of our bodies as we age. Babies have more lactase because we need to drink breast milk. And as we age, we make less lactase. So therefore, milk does not break down our bodies the same way. It makes us very gassy and um, or gives you even maybe higher levels of indigestion. But and lactose intolerance is very um, personal as well. So people will have a negative response to dairy and assume it's bad for them. And it's not really that it's bad for you. It's just that your body is no longer set up to handle the processing of dairy. And that's a very common situation. And if you want to still eat dairy, you can um, just take some lactate and you'll probably be all right. In most cases, you'll probably be all right. Now, some people do have daily allergies and stuff like that, and that that your doctor can figure that out for you, but the average in individual does not. And you can, if you really want some ice cream and regular ice cream, uh, have some lactate. If you um, also, I don't drink milk anymore. Like personally for me, it's just not worth the trouble. I drink almond milk because um, I find that to just be you know easier for me to do. If I want a bowl of cereal, I'd rather do that than it's not necessarily healthier than milk. It doesn't have much protein, um, but it is a good alternative for my lifestyle and it works for me. So like, just do what you like. I just don't, I just like to clear up that point of misinformation because people often say dairy is bad for you. And it's, it's not a matter of being bad for you. That's not incorrect. It's just that we're no longer able to process it as adults because that's pretty much how we're built. We're not really meant to. Um, I, for the point of trying something new, I think that this is um, more maybe a personal thing for me. I'm just trying to pull it out to other individuals. Uh, I try to cook food that I don't know how to cook. So I look to other cultures that um, to like, I look at recipes for Indian cultures and Asian cultures and African cultures, like, you know, proper, Af Africa proper, um, not soul food per se in the American, Af the African American sense, but like maybe like a, a fufu or something of that nature, just to see what other cultures cook because often their food's just significantly healthier than ours. Um, Indian cultures lean toward vegetarianism uh, so in certain aspects, some culture, like some religions for them lean towards, so you'll find recipes that are more uh, vegetarian friendly very often. Um, Asian cultures naturally 
eat the meat diets that have significantly less meat and more seafood. So um, those diet, like their diet, the diets of other cultures happen to be healthier than ours. I, the one we've established is bad. And, that, and as those countries have modernized, they've established practices that are very similar to American eating and they're finding disease states in their, in their, um, in their cultures that they did not previously have. Like China has a boon of diabetes right now that was not there 20 years ago because they're all of a sudden trying to eat like Americanized, like modern, like our way of eating and our way of eating is not great. So um, it's not, so leaning toward, you know, recipes and stuff from other cultures can help you discover new foods and new spicing techniques and new um, flavor profiles that you may enjoy that you never, just you've never had and may help you just establish, um, you know, just better practices in that front. Um, as when I say redefine meals, this is more to maybe a single individual who's not maybe preparing food for a family um, uh, or, you know, even if you are preparing food for a family, maybe just what you want to do on your own part. We've established a breakfast, lunch, and dinner sort of life, lifestyle for ourselves. And um, that doesn't have to be required. And every meal doesn't have to have a sit down, you know, my plate version of, you know, we would ask that you please have half a plate of vegetables, a fourth of a plate of starch, and a fourth of a plate of protein. Um, uh, and when I say vegetables, I mean non-starchy vegetables. So like broccoli, leafy greens, um, stuff of that nature, not necessarily a corn. Corn is a starchy. Um, carbohydrate. So we would say that that would count as your carbohydrate or a sweet potato or a potato will also count as your carbohydrate. It's so not really a vegetable. Um, vegetables, we really want sort of go green on that. And because um, those have your higher nutrient levels as well as your lower calorie levels. And like I said, we need more fiber and um, nutrients in our diet than we usually get. So, but I was saying, I to this point, I was saying, if you're not hungry at for dinner at 7.30 and all you want is to eat is a banana and some almonds, go ahead. Like, that's okay. But you don't have to have a meal just because it's meal time. Um, eat within what you want, you know, reasonable. But don't, like, I'm not saying also don't skip foods because you should eat within a, reg a reasonable calorie limit. It's never smart to starve yourself to reach a calorie goal. You're not going to hate yourself into, into weight loss. It's not going to work. You cannot hate yourself into weight loss. You cannot like starve yourself. You can starve yourself into weight loss, but it's not going to last. And you won't have learned any better practices around eating. You have just deprived yourself of food. Um, that's not really the best way to go about. Like I said, this is a lifestyle change, not on something that you want to um, make horrible for yourself. So eat what you want, but eat within reason. And um, I say to hide vegetables in kids' food because I hear that I don't have any children myself, but I hear that they're picky eaters. Um, uh, and so it's a good way, like I find that cauliflower rice hides very well in rice. Um, like I'm a big fan of zoodles myself because I just try to keep watching my carbohydrate intake. So um, you can put, you can sneak your, um, some, you know, zucchini noodles in with regular noodles and that'll increase your vegetable intake as well. So these was also, while I'm, I'm not really necessarily needing to, you to cut back on your carbohydrate intake. Um, it should be reasonable. Like when I say cut back your carbohydrate intake, I'm not referring to healthy things like, you know, brown rice or even regular rice or, you know, like potatoes or sweet potatoes, even or corn. I'm not referring to those carbohydrates because those are better sources of carbohydrate. When I say cut back your carbohydrate intake, I mean, think about things like chips and cookies and crackers and like those obscure items that sort of we snack on and um, often and we just add to our foods that aren't necessarily the healthiest and also to watch our portion control. Um, a serving of anything, any carbohydrate thing should probably be about half a cup. And I advise you, if you really don't know what that looks like, to go get a measuring cup and scoop that out because it's much smaller than you probably think. Um, so I, I promise you, you probably would be satisfied with a half a cup of, or maybe even a cup of, but you just understand that um, we often serve food, especially in this country as well. Our portion control is not, our portion controls our portion sizes have been distorted here. They're much higher than pretty much every other country. So um, we eat a lot more food here than other countries as well. So that also leads to why we have poor health outcomes um, in this country than other countries because we're kind of greedy. But it's sort of like I said, it's um, it's it's something we've been grown into. So it's not like really any one particular person's fault. It's it's not like you are greedy. It's like we've gotten used to seeing a certain amount of food being given to us for like a price at a restaurant. And if we don't see that much food, we feel like we're getting taken. And it's like, no, it's just, we really don't need that much food in reality. So we're just 
like our bagels here are just you know three times the size bagels used to be here and then still larger than they are in other countries. Um, like just food here is very big. And so <laughs> um, it doesn't help us, like there's very little marketing out there that's gonna help you eat healthier. The food, um, like as much as um, we need to eat it. And I uh, don't think that our food companies are evil in the sense that they are trying to harm us, but they are trying to make as much money as possible. So with that in mind, you have to consider that they may not give you what you need. They'll give you what you want well before what you need. Um, um, in terms of uh, cooking, meal planning also helps you live a very healthy lifestyle. Now, I know that we all do not have the time and we don't think that we have the time to um, necessarily meal prep and plan, but it saves so much time and money that I really suggest that everyone, if you have a chance to just give it a try, give it a whirl, see if it works for you. Because I found that in my experience and with helping other individuals like learn to do so as well, um, that they uh, find it very beneficial. And while it does take time in that moment to do the meal prep and like the planning, like to look at, you know, figure out what you want to eat for the week and figure out, you know, how much you need to buy to make those meals. It does take some time around that and does take time to cook it. It does save you time for the recipe because you don't have to cook again as many times. Like, or you, you just have to like warm up things usually or just like, you know, do some quick preparation on certain pieces. And it saves you a lot of time if, and on the in, on the other end of that, as well as money because you, then when you purchase the food, you're not buying extra things. You're not last minute buying food. You're not doing, and you can be more mindful about what you're purchasing. So you don't buy extra things like those cookies you might not need. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you also won't run last minute to buy fast food. So um, it saves you a lot of time and money over the course of time. So I definitely suggest that people do that if they can. Um, uh, if you have kids, it's beneficial to, this is a good time since they're stuck with you and you're stuck with them and there's hybrid learning and Laura know what time, what you have to do with them during the day. Helping, having like children help you make food is um, a great way to get them acclimated to cooking themselves. A lot of our children are not learning to cook and that's not necessarily the healthiest way to grow up. And um, it gives them a chance to feel more participatory in the in what they're eating. So they'll, they get more excited, I feel, at least in my experience, uh, when I work with little kids, um, that they uh, get more excited about eating like healthier, like little snacks that they've helped make or fun little treats. Um, like they made me like, the, I don't know, Anton Log. I don't know if kids are still to that, but stuff like that. I've done like, we've made, um, I, for Halloween, I've done like little pretzel spiders with peanut butter, um, stuff like that. Like if you help, if the kids help doing those uh, activities of making snacks and like stuff and food preparation, you can help them. They can help you chop vegetables for dinner when you're doing the meal prep. If you, if you think they're safe enough to hold a knife or they can help you peel potatoes, something like that. Um, they it helps them get, you know, participate in the activity and then they'll appreciate the food, like the healthiness of the food more. It, they, they just seem to like the idea that they help make it. So um, that helps them establish healthier food habits down the road for them as well. Um, and I was asked to speak toward disease management. So I'm going to just say that like, you know, nutritional needs do vary if you do find yourself having a chronic disease. And that's pretty much really what a dietitian is trained in. Um, a lot of people think dietitians are really just like, I guess, new, nutri regular nutrition. I, mean, I don't even know what regular nutritionist is. Truthfully, anyone can call themselves a nutritionist and get like a 90 minute overnight certification to a two years. I don't even know really what certifications on that level are. Um, but uh, dietitians, we are trained specifically really, we can help you with weight loss, but that's really not what our calling is in life. Um, we are medically trained to help people with disease states. So if you, uh, we work mostly in hospitals, long-term care centers, and um, really like food service industry to um, help uh, to help make meals and help individuals that have disease states really, or find themselves in this degree of critical need, uh, help them meet their needs nutritionally. Really, that's what our goals are. Um, if someone can't eat, help figure out how to get food into them. So we also um, are trained in how to provide parental nutrition as well as enteral nutrition. So like feeding tubes and if, you know, if they can't ingest food at all, um, food through uh, intravenous sources. Um, so that's really what we're trained in. And so if you have disease states or diabetes, now we say we're, we're meant to help chronic disease. 
because diabetes, heart disease, kidney failure, those type of diseases can be, they can be cured by diet, they can be highly managed by diet to the point where you, like for diabetes, you can, if you, you know, follow a very strict diet and follow what you should be eating as a diabetic, you can sort of exist as though you don't have diabetes in a sense. You will still have diabetes very much, but you can exist as though you don't. And when I say exist as though you don't, I say your body will function as well. You can't just go, go crazy and start eating like a, you know, eat all the carbohydrates in the world again, because that's what carbo carbohydrates are what diabetics have to watch eating. You can't just eat what you want all of a sudden. So that part of your lifestyle will not come back, but you cannot have the issues that may come later in life that diabetes causes. Diabetes is a very quietly bad disease until it becomes loudly bad. And when and by the time it's loud, it's a problem. Like it can cause nerve damage, blindness. It can damage your kidneys. It's a very, very quietly bad disease until it's loud. And you don't really want it because I've seen through my rotations and just, you know, personally people I know, um, it's, um, it can so much lessen your quality of life later because you've worked all this time. You know, you're, you're 30 and you're diagnosed with diabetes and you think nothing of it and you continue to live your life. And then when you're 70, you have a host of health problems and um, it's, it's, you, you can't live the life that you plan to live in retirement. You know, you're over here now, you're going to the hospital all the time. You're spent all of your money on medical treatment. You, if you didn't spend all your money on medical treatment, you can't really go do anything because they chopped your leg off. You know, like, um, it's not really the best. It can really um, cause a lot of lack of quality of life later in life if you do not address, like if you do not try to maybe eat healthier earlier in life for these disease states. And that's really why I became a dietitian because I want to help people learn to maybe meet these issues earlier so that they can have a better quality of life when they're older and not necessarily have, um, a, you know, cause like I said, these things don't have to kill you. Um, they can though but they don't have to, and they are very manageable by diet. So it's really good to maybe get with the dietitian if you have the opportunity to do so. A lot of um, these disease states, as well as um, I think obesity, allows for a lot of um, insurance covered medical treatment on this front. Like you can speak to a dietitian on that level. So if you, if you do find yourself with any of these disease states, you can, you should try to see if your insurance or cover um, some degree of nutrition counseling, just to make sure that you're on the right track so that if these get worse, because when these get bad, that's really when it's a problem. But if you if you catch them early, you can potentially try to, um, you know, uh, mitigate any further decline in health by you know eating better. And so, I mean, not completely by eating better, but a lot of it by eating better, and maybe not even need medication on certain fronts. So, it's a great way to try to um, not you know have these horrible, have these bad diseases you know, ruin your life, because they don't have to, they really don't. Okay, so um, I did say there'd be time for questions and answers, so if you have any questions, I have answers, so. Um. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I loved so many of the points that you made in that presentation. I, and apparently Denise too, also drink almond milk, <laughs> and I love it. I made the switch. I stopped doing cow's milk, like, almost a year ago, and I, I very much enjoy oh, it. No, I, um, I, I, I myself, I switched, I want to say, probably six years ago, I started drinking soy milk and I hated it. I hated every moment of it. I thought it was disgusting, but I was like, oh, I could just, I, regular milk just makes me fire too gassy. I just couldn't do it anymore. I was like, oh my. And it's like, it wasn't a matter of, it was just uncomfortable. And I was like, I don't want to feel like this. So I was like, let me not drink this. But I really did not like drinking soy milk. I was like, let me just drink it though anyway. And I was like, when all the milk showed up, I was just the happiest girl in the world. I don't, I, there's nothing wrong with oat milk. I just don't buy it because it costs more than almond milk. And there's way more carbohydrates in it. And so there's nothing wrong with it at all. Like I'm saying, all these milks are, even regular milk is okay. It's just a matter of what can you do? Like what, what's, what's your comfort level with it? So, um, yeah. I do have a couple of questions that people asked before today's meeting. If anyone has wants to build on the questions that I'm going to ask or wants to ask additional questions, please let me know. You can either put them through the chat. I think your group is small enough that you guys can unmute um, if you find a, a good place to interject, but if not, always through the chat. So. Um, one of the questions I have are, what are some of the best foods to eat that are cheap and affordable? Um, the best foods to eat and are cheap and affordable, it really matters what you're, unfortunately, I hate, I hate that being a dietitian is a very weird thing because everyone's different. It's like, so everyone is like, it's very, like nutrition is a, such a personal thing. And people always ask, what is the one thing I can do that everyone can do? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. There's really not one answer for everybody. 
the only thing that most dietitians can say on a front on a whole front is eat more vegetables. So with that being said, what's the cheapest form of vegetables? And that's well, I often tie vegetable eating to um, higher costs. I don't necessarily think that is the case. It's really more of vegetables do cost more money than in some cases. It really matters what you're looking for. Like if you want a salad at Panera, that does cost more than a burger at Burger King. I don't suggest you ever go to Burger King. I own the Panera when I'm so fancy. Um, <laughs> like, but um, so I definitely suggest instead of like buying more vegetables for snacks is really how I would suggest you go about such things. Like bags of chips aren't cheap either. I don't, like I said, I don't have any children. So I didn't really realize quite how much these little snacks cost. They're very expensive. If you don't buy them, you can save a lot of money. <laughs> like, so if I find myself for, for myself, I do a lot of shopping, particularly at Aldi's, honestly. Um, Wellness has better produce, but Aldi's gets me by. Price right. If you want to eat it that day, go ahead. But I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't waste, um, I wouldn't go there and uh, extend it out too long. Um, I buy a lot of cucumbers. I buy a lot of cherry tomatoes, or just regular tomatoes. I try to buy low calorie vegetables to snack on. Baby carrots. Um, I don't, you can't really snack on a mushroom, I don't think. So I <laughs> that. Some people do like bell peppers. I'm not a fan of those, but if you like them and you want to chat, like I really my celery, my suggestion on that front though is to really just with the meal prepping, buy like you know, bulk vegetables, um, chop them up and just have them ready in your so when you do start finding yourself reaching for a snack, it's a healthier snack. It's a vegetable-based snack, so you get your nutrients. Cucumbers are full of water. Oh, I didn't say that. Please drink more water, everyone. <laughs> drink all the water. Don't drink coffee if you want. Coffee's really not bad for you. It's just not great for you. It's a little dehydrating. Don't drink it all day. <laughs> Water, um, they, the, 64 or more ounces a day, please. Um, Miss, would you say that there's a difference in terms of maybe nutritional value between frozen vegetables and fresh vegetables? Is there one that we should be oh, looking out um, for? That is not a concern that I would say. Um, a lot of people are concerned. There's so many just... The, uh, this is the funny thing. There's just so much misinformation um, about what is healthy and what's not. Frozen vegetables are not worse than fresh vegetables. Um, in some cases, frozen vegetables can be even healthier than fresh vegetables because fro frozen vegetables are taken from the field, frozen, and then chipped. And that stops the in, 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 sorry, the word is not coming out of my mouth. Enzymatic reaction in the vegetable right then. So it'll potentially have more nutrients than a vegetable that was shipped from far away and has to get to the vet, has to get to wherever you shipped it from, then gets to put out on the shelf from the store. And then you don't know how, how long that vegetable's really been picked from the ground. Cause that's when it starts, you know, when, when it gets picked, when it starts technically degrading over time. And so your, um, fresh, your frozen vegetables potentially can have more nutrients than your fresh vegetables. Both are very good to eat. Um, even your canned vegetables are good to eat however they are canned and can off, canning adds sodium to them. So we ask that if you are going to use canned vegetables, please rinse them first. They're not they're tasty anyway, so I don't really, but they are a good way to have preserved vegetables. And um, uh, so even those are better. And people also, I'll just the organic thing too while we're at it. Organic vegetables are perfectly fine to eat, um, but so are regular vegetables. The average American does not eat enough vegetables in the first place to truly be concerned about the pesticide levels. Please wash your fruit. Please wash your vegetables. That'll probably get a lot of it off. And um, and like I said, there's a lot of changes that need to happen to our overall food system. With those changes, I'm not sure if people would actually go with the like. It would cause a high degree of inconvenience for the average individual for the country to take on the level of food change we need to do. We should do it. We really should probably try to get to more small scale farming. These things should occur. I don't know if they ever will because people aren't going to push for that. Because as much as they want healthier food, to, they, we have to demand healthier food. As you see, there's there's keto everything right now. There's low carb. There's anything that we like. There's gluten free. If anything that the market asks for will be supplied, we have to demand it. So um, it's really if people demand that they want pesticide free food on every front and don't eat the food that doesn't have pesticides. Like, you know, if, if you want, if you don't want like large scale farming to continue, if you don't want your animals, you know, your, your meat sources coming from, you know, big old farms and you only want Absolutely. getting that. And I don't know if people are really willing to do that level of um, inconvenience. And so since I don't see people actually moving toward that, I don't see it actually happening. But the market will just move wherever. Um, Absolutely. Go. 
Okay, so I have another question, switching gears a little bit. Um, Uma submitted this through the chat. Is cheese bad for you or good for you? I feel like this is an age old question and that the answer always changes every five years that cheese has some good things for you and then cheese is bad for you. So as a that cheese is, lover, cheese like, and eggs, both, both are very, they get flip flopped all the time. Um, <laughs> neither are bad, like cheese is not bad for you. Eating cheese every meal every day is bad for you. And I will do that if you let me, I love cheese. Um, <laughs> Like cheese causes me no indigestion. So uh, cheese is very low lactose. So, but like I said, everyone's level of lactose intolerance is very different. Some people can't eat a, eat a piece of cheese and have to go straight to the bathroom. I can eat all the cheese in the world, I'm fine. Um, cheese is not bad for you. It's just high, very highly caloric. It is a very high source of saturated fat. We as dietitians want you to get good fats in. Your almonds, avocados, your olive oils. The Mediterranean diet is a diet that is very, I guess, all those things friendly. Um, I, they, that diet also suggested you drink wine. And <laughs> while wine is not bad for you, it's like you can have wine in reasonable quantities. Um, they said that, I think it's really just, there's more tied, like even in the most well-run research study, um, there's factors that you cannot account for. So they say that these people are fine. They drink wine every day. They drink two glasses even, and they're healthier than us. That's, the wine's not making them healthy. <laughs> the wine does not make them healthy. Just healthy. Be, like people over the, in like Italy and those countries, they have a completely different like approach to life than we do in America. We're very high stress. We're like work all day. We're like work all night. And they're, they're like, <laughs> I, I was in Italy and I was we were at the store and they were like, get out. We do not want to sell you anything. It's time for us to go on break. Yeah. <laughs> like they, they're very very. They they're much more work life balance focus over there, which leads to lower stress levels, which leads to better cortisol levels, which leads to less, less better health. Like all these, like there's so many- It's all connected. That, it's all connected. So um, it's not a matter of simply saying uh, that a, di a certain diet is good for you or bad for you. It's really a matter of um, knowing that e eating just eat as eat healthy as possible. And really like the only thing I can say that's healthy as possible is eat way vegetables, probably eat less meat. Probably, like, I'm basically on just with your standard way of American. Of course. Food. Like eat way more vegetables. Eat, <laughs> um, eat less nonsense. Like, you know, like, like eat less cupcakes. Eat less yes, less shit. Yes. Like, you know, and then you'll probably be in a better place. Like, it's really that. It's really, it's really just, and that's not new information, but it's not, you know, it's not fancy. It's not sensible. Yeah. Like, don't lose weight right away because the keto diet will work, but it's not healthy. Um, yes. And you probably uh, so like so it does work. I'll give you a, I, you'll lose weight. You will lose weight very quickly. You'll see those results you wanted to see and everything will be great. And then if you try, if you try to go back to eating the exact pattern you were eating before, you will most likely gain all that weight back. And gotcha. where our bodies function when weight loss occurs, that um, it's not really the sunniest thing. Your body will try to get you back to the highest weight you've ever been for the duration of your lifestyle. Like the gotcha. rest of your life. So if you so lost all weight, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. There's so many questions. It's okay. it's okay. I don't want to cut you off, but I see Ola has a question in the chat. Ola, do you want to yeah. unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, sure. So, um, I just wanted to ask because I am allergic to avocados, and they're one of the like the healthy oils out there. What else can we like use instead of that? Um, and if okay, you're allergic to avocados, and then I didn't mm -hmm. hear. Yes. I, just avocados, or do you say something else too? Just avocados. If you're allergic to avocados, I'm trying to think of a good high fat source. Hmm. Um, so you have nuts. Nuts are still a thing. Those will probably be okay. Um, coconut oil is a mixed thing. I really don't like to suggest it because it's also very high in saturated fat. Uh, do you? Uh, if you're trying to figure out what you can eat, like that's like an avocado and not an avocado, I, there's really not a whole lot of things out there. I have heard of people blending up edamame and like making things that are similar, but it's really just green soybeans are um, a great source of, uh, a complete source of protein. Uh, our vegetable proteins and our um, uh, meat proteins are different. Meat protein is a complete protein. So the proteins that come from eggs and dairy and um, uh, meat, like fish and cows and chickens, that's a, that's a complete protein. The protein that comes from vegetables are usually incomplete protein. Um, not that they're bad proteins, they're just not the, a complete mix of all the proteins you need. So it's not that this, you can mix them up, like you can have rice and beans that can create a complete protein, but um, it's not something like eat. If, so if you're eating a vegetarian or simply, you know, vegetarian diet, you may need some um, 
alterations, just make sure you're getting enough protein that will help your body do what it needs. Also, since a lot of people do do low carb diet, um, they often eat a very high protein diet because they're low carb. And um, if you're on a very high protein diet, you don't really probably need that much protein. The average woman only needs the 60 to about 60 grams of protein. The average man only needs about 70 grams. And those diets usually end up prescribing you in a sense, um, maybe a hundred or more. And I mean, it's not anything that's bad. Your body will turn into the glucose it needs regardless. Um, but it's just that those diets end up doing that for that reason. Uh, you were, you didn't ask that question. So back to, um, <laughs> um, like, uh, yeah, that's the only thing I can really suggest is going to kind of look like an avocado, but it won't have the same values. Like avocados are, like, a, I don't like to call anything a super food, food, food. That doesn't really make any sense, but it's like, it's, it's a pretty amazing fruit in and of itself. There's really not anything that matches it in like fiber and fat content um, because it's a very fibrous, but, and fatty fruit. It's very, you know, it's weird. It's a weird, weird thing. It's but, good, um, it's, it's delicious. <laughs> and, well, I, some people don't like them. I like them. I think it's very good. Um, I'm a big guac fan and uh, uh, um, I, I like to make a lot of avocado pasta, but if you're allergic to it, you know, of course don't eat it. Um, like I have heard edamame, but it's not going to necessarily work in the exact same way because edamame is not fat. There's no fat in edamame. Um, it's just, I have heard of people maybe using it to make like a similar type of guacamole type feel though. Like, like it looks sort of like it. Um, I have heard of people using it in lieu of, um, like they mix it with hummus and it can be good. Uh, so that may be a potentiality that you might want to seek out, but really just to replace an avocado straight out. That's just gonna have to be done with separate foods that aren't avocados. It's really if you're talking nutrient wise, it wouldn't be. There's like not anything that's quite like an avocado that's gonna work like an avocado. Talking about nutrients, we did get another question in the chat from Uma who asks, "Do herbal supplements work? And what about vitamins in terms of uh, your diet?" They don't not work. There's just not enough science around if they do anything. That's the thing. Um, we, uh, there's just not enough science behind a lot of herbal supplement usage and a lot of, um, as dietitians, we suggest you take a multivitamin, like, you know, a basic whatever over the counter multivitamin for your age range. So 50 plus like women's, men's, something simple like that, usually about $8 a bottle or so, um, for like a hundred. <laughs> uh, those, we suggest you take maybe one of those a day just because most people don't eat at the level to get all the nutrients they need in a day, all the vitamins they need from their food. Um, you don't want to overdo it. Like you don't want to get crazy and start buying all these vitamins. This is very rare that you will probably take enough of any particular vitamin to cause toxicity, but you can. The only time, like the only one you really have to be questionable about, people have done this is hurt and hurt themselves, is maybe vitamin A. If you over supplement with vitamin A, you can cause yourself some issues. If you're eating food, it's very, very, if you're just eating food, it's very unlikely you'll ever eat too much of any particular vegetable or fruit or meat or anything to over, if you eat a, like an entire bear liver, you'll die. <laughs> it's like fun. you'd have to eat a big old liver and so it's not like uh like it's not gonna happen um there's if you're eating food it's very rare you won't get into toxicity issue if you're supplementing and you're taking more of a particular vitamin then you, then, you know you'll be able to get through food sources that could potentially be harmful a vitamin c you don't really have to worry about too much if you take too much vitamin c or that usually comes out in your urine if you're sick um so if you have like, if you're on certain medications, you need to watch certain vitamins and your doctor will tell you that. So you won't not know that. If you're on like Coumadin, you need to watch your vitamin K intake. And that imagine you shouldn't get vitamin K. It's just a matter of you need to keep it level. It's very much if you're a diabetic and you have carbohydrate issues now, um, you have to keep, it's not a matter of not having carbohydrates. It's a matter of keeping your, heart, your, your um, blood sugar levels at a certain level. So the same thing will happen with your vitamin K if you're on Coumadin. But, um, it's not a matter of work and don't work. There's just very little science behind certain things. Like we've, like they've done science, like ACV, like, okay, so apple cider vinegar, people say it does everything. And I love apple cider vinegar. It makes my hair nice. I, I <laughs> just, it's everything. It's good for stuff. It's good for something, but we can only, we've only proven so far that it helps regulate blood sugar. It can help some people um, if they have a positive ovarian syndrome, so PCOS, if they have that. Um, it, they've done studies that show that it can help sometimes with stuff with symptoms of that. Um, but all the other claims, we have no proof. Like they've done studies for those things and there's just not, there's not the level of statistical significance to prove that it does anything. It might anecdotally, and I don't want to discount anecdotal evidence. Like um, the, uh, someone's asking about Ayurvedic um, medicine and um, uh, Ash, I don't know how to say it right, but that, <laughs> Ashwagandha, 
I'll just let me go hang up everything. Ashwagandha. Um, I'm actually taking that myself. I didn't notice any difference. Um, but I do like um, like, but it's really that's what I'm saying. Like, there's no science to prove that anything will occur. There, I, there's like said, there's some degree of anecdotal evidence. Uh, I don't think that anyone can say that there's completely no truth to these items because um, people have been doing it for centuries. Like I said, rice and beans um, creates a complete protein. I don't think that's by mistake. I think it's because people realize, especially back in the day before we had, people don't realize that people were very different. Like when we had no entertainment, there was a lot of, like, there was no, like there was no TV. We didn't have books for a long time. People just did things. And um, I think through that, like through like seeing, like we existed for centuries just doing stuff and finding out what works, what didn't work with. Like, so I don't think there's no, like there's no, Proof to these things working. It's just, I mean, it's just that we don't have the science to prove it. We don't have. We, there's no clinical control study. Some of the stuff is really like when the when studies are done on most occasions, we can't. Like it's not it's not. There's not enough um actual statistical, statistical significance to show that this one item is causing beneficial things. But there's to say that um there's a lot more science coming towards study now actually as well because a lot of studies, especially medic, medical science. People don't really understand quite how, um, I want to say, infant stage that all medicine is. Like we've probably been discussing this in the level that we're discussing it now for maybe a hundred years. Like you know, surgeries were very, very, very brutal and um, like barbaric. Like just a hundred years ago, like they were bloodletting people and yeah, pain from the sand. Like like I'm saying, like I was like. I was like we're just finding out about our microbiome, like our gut, our gut health is much more important than we thought it was. We didn't know anything about that. We're, often people look at scientists like, you got it wrong. And it's like, we, we, we just knew what we knew at the moment. We're like, um, it's absolutely, but we're, it's, it's, we're all learning a lot of this together. Like we didn't like the farming hand studies, like heart health. We're just, that's all based on pretty much the study that happened in 1950, 1960. Like we're learning and then also, and that's really just for white men. It was really not for really anybody else. It was only really good for them that there were no minorities in the study, not a one. Now we're doing it again with minorities. Like we're like a lot of studies that we're finding out, um, like women and minorities. I'm just talking about really. It was really just for white men. Like that was it. It was the statistics. Like all our heart information, all our heart like advice. Not that it's wrong, but it's all based on one type of person. And people are like, unfortunately, like we're different. We're a little different. Not whole like there's very little like biological significance to all the races like genetically, but they do make for little differences that can cause um, some nutritional thing changes. Um, like African Americans and Asians are much less like are much more likely to lactose intolerance than our Caucasian counterparts. It's just mm -hmm. like some degree environmental play within our genetics. So um, it's not that these things don't work. It's just there's no proof that they work. And then we usually do studies. We can't isolate the one part of it that is accurate because Wow, like I think our, I think that our like more ancient cultures were just more aware because like I said, there were no other things. So they were focusing on like, there was one person that looked at stars a lot. They looked at stars enough to know seasons to the constellation. This is coming, the new comments want to come again. Like that's a lot of, like that's how much they were just doing what they do. Um, yeah. And like, so it's very different. Like they, I think they discover things without really fully knowing what they were discovering. So yeah. Thank you so much. Um, that was an amazing presentation. I feel I took so many notes of things that I'm now going to incorporate in my <laughs> lifestyle and diet changes. So thank you so much for coming today. I wanna to thank everybody um, for coming back for our spring series. I wanna share something really quickly before um, everybody goes. Our next meeting is going to be, is going to be, um, March 10th, we're going to have uh, Dr. Tim Murphy. He's going to talk to us about the COVID-19 vaccine um, and a little bit more information is, uh, about that is on the way. So if you guys want to head over to our brand new website, uh, irineagarahec.org backslash events, you'll be able to register for this one. Um, everybody who attended today will get an email about it. Um, but just to give you guys a little sneak peek about what's coming next in the COVID-19 Lecture and Learn series. Thank you so much to Rachel for her amazing presentation. Thank I will so be sending every. Me. Yes, thank you for being here. I'm going to send everybody the link to the YouTube if you guys want to rewatch. I'm also going to attach Rachel's contact information if you wanted yeah. to set up um, private meetings with her um, or just ask her a little bit more about, you know, dietetics. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I ha I answer questions for free on Instagram and Facebook. So <laughs> like, if you just want to shoot me some questions on there, it's a real life, a real, I don't know, real underscore life 
rd underscore rd on instagram and real life dietetics and consulting on facebook and like i said if you just ask me questions on there i'll respond so, um, I will make sure to add those to the email that everyone will get. Thank you so much for being here you. today. Like I said, this uh, video will be on our YouTube and I will share the link with everybody. So everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Rachel, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.